welcome to landscaping and pest control. Uh, my name is Brian Deerwalker. I'm a uh, program specialist with Bloomington HRA. We sponsor three of these event, events uh, each and every summer. This is the first one. The second event will be held uh, July 10th, and that one is LED lighting and installation. And we'll have a third seminar August 7th, which is uh, tile installation and uh, choosing the right tile. Home Depot has actually graciously donated their time for all three seminars, so we're very happy to have them tonight. Um, before I introduce our uh, speakers tonight, I would like to make another announcement about um, our Housing and Redevelopment Authority's uh, rehab loan program. We have brochures that uh, outline our program, and it's a great way to finance home improvements. If, you, uh, if you're stimulated with some ideas on home improvements you want to do, it's a great way to finance. So. I uh, hope you keep that in mind. We have Pat McDonald, who is our pro uh, project coordinator at Home Depot. She's, she's been a very big help to us, not only for this, but for our home improvement fairs that we have every other year. And then we have our speaker, the main man tonight, is uh, Brad Phillips. He is a hor uh, horticulturist. Did I say that right? Horticulturist. And uh, he will uh, go through. He's very knowledgeable. I know that he's extremely knowledgeable because every time I go to Home Depot, he, if I have any gardening needs at all, he's the man to talk to if you can get to him, because he's usually two or three deep in customers. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Brad. All right. Thank you for all coming here today. I'd like to um, thank you for that. A um, little bit about my background is I have a two-year degree in landscape design. I have then uh, worked nine years in local nurseries around the area and 17 years with Home Depot in their garden center. So I am MNLA certified, so it's a very long test that you have to take in order to qualify that, for that. A lot of people who go to school for four years fail this test, and it's a four-hour test that you have to go through, question and answer, essay, multiple choice, true and false, all of that. So there isn't really a question I haven't been asked, so I encourage you to ask them as I go along and stop me. Um, I'm going to start out the pro uh, tonight by talking about some common things like your lawn, lawn and weed control, because everybody has a lawn if they own a home. Um, so <laughs> we're going to talk about things that are going on right now with them that you may need to know about or that you don't know you have. And we're going to talk about some options for you. Then we are going to go into uh, some landscaping, your trees and shrubs, and then perennials, and then your annuals. And I'll be going more into something most designers don't talk about is textures and colors. I, I design that way versus uh, flowers. Flowers are a bonus because when you're not seeing flowers, you're seeing the uh, textures and other colors of the foliage. So I'm going to talk more about why you design that way first because your design will be more enhanced once you have the flowers. So it'll just add to everything. And uh, that's why you get curb appeal. And talk about a little bit about why you put color by the door and focus with larger plants on the outside of the house to um, soften your landscape. So some of the problems that I see uh, right now that we get asked uh, early spring is, what should I do first? Um, a lot of people haven't um, fertilized their lawn yet, and they aren't doing weed control. Now, whether or not you like to do it organically or not, uh, we do have many options for you. And uh, one of the options are you can do your broadleaf, which is called a post-emergence uh, fertilizing. That particular uh, fertilizer is uh, put down uh, early in the morning with a heavy dew. It has to stick to the foliage for a 12-hour period and not be washed off. And then it's absorbed by the plant and then kills the root. So you got to make sure that you have a 12-hour period. That means turn off your sprinklers, make sure it's not going to rain the, that same day because that product will not do what you want it to do if you don't do those things. Um, early in the spring is a product I like to use always, is pre-emergent. And that's the first step of all fertilizing. It is put down early in the spring, probably when the frost is out of the ground, I like to say. At least a little. Um, so it is absorbed into the ground. And what that does is it um, kind of sterilizes the ground from all weed seeds. Now, that doesn't kill the weeds that have a root. It only stops 
seeds from germinating. And the cheapest one out there is going to stop grass seed from germinating too. So you need to know when you go into a local nursery that you want to put that step down. You may say you don't have weeds, you may say you have weeds, but it's really critical that you put it down right away in the spring to keep the weeds that you have there and not have a whole lot more come July because you're gonna get crabgrass and more dandelions and more other broadleaf weeds than you can imagine if you don't do it. Um, so that's why I really recommend that step. It's really too late to put it down now. Usually they say that by the time that the lilacs bloom, uh, you should probably stop putting any pre-mergent down. Um, if you haven't done any and you'd like to do some control, it is okay to put it down, but you will find out that some of the seeds have already started to germinate and you will not have 100% control if you would have put it down prior to that. So, that is a mistake that a lot of people make. Um, the, when you go to the local nursery and you're going to go for a pre-emergent, please ask for a pre-emergent. If you're gonna seed, you wanna ask for a pre-emergent that will um, not sterilize grass seed. And they do have a product out there. It is very expensive. It's gonna cost you about, for, at Home Depot, it's gonna cost you $35 for 5,000 square foot. At Bachman's and Lowe's and all those other places, well, not Lowe's, but Bachman's and Gertens, it's going to probably cost you about 60 bucks for a 5,000 square foot bag. There are pre-emergent pre um, organic ways of doing it, and that's cor uh, corn gluten that you'd put down earlier to stop those weed seeds. Um, but the starter pre-emergent is going to um, allow grass seed to germinate. And we have a couple different kinds, whether you go Scott's or Pennington. That's these right here. And you have easy seed. Early in the spring, you get a lot of dogs, uh, spots, and things like that. And you have little dieback throughout the season. And you might want to put something down that'll help with that. With the easy seed, that's more for dog spots, the little brown spots that you have. You sprinkle it down, water it. When the easy seed is uh, watered properly, it looks chocolate brown. And you only need to put about a quarter of an inch or an eighth inch down. And uh, it swells up, encapsulates the seed, and it has fertilizer in it. And it's a very good um, grass seed slash fertilizer and mulch all together grow for growing. Um, the great thing about it is when it looks chocolate brown, it's watered properly. Uh, when it looks cardboard brown, it needs some water. And it's critical when seed is germinating that you water it all the time. Uh, grass seed takes about, you could start seeing some germination within 10 days, but it takes almost 21 days for it to fully be germinated because of the different mixes and grasses that are in it. All right, so it's very critical. Some uh, things between Scott's and Pennington. Scott's has, um, oops. Scott's has a, uh, I think it's sulfur wrapped around the thing, uh, wrapped around the seed. And uh, this is supposed to help keep water around the grass seed so that it has a better chance of germinating. So if it's exposed to the sun and all of that. Um, so it is a good product if you're not very good at watering. Uh, I always recommend a good mix. Uh, this is sun and shade, so you have Kentucky bluegrasses which for full sun, red fescue is for shade, and uh, regular uh, perennial rye, which is both for sun and shade. They all germinate at different rates, so uh, very good mix for those that maybe are having problems watering. Pennington, they have a smart seed technology. And although you still have to water, if you do water it properly and you get it to germinate, that's where this technology is gonna take over. And once it germinates, it explodes in a hair root, so you'll get three times the roots on this seed than you will on that. They still use the same brands, uh, the Kentucky Bluegrass, Red Fescue, and Rye, but they're just coating it with a different micronutrient to help it um, explode in the hair root system. So if you're, not, if you're good at watering, I recommend this. There's gonna be more seed in a the bag. They call it a three pound bag versus that's a three pound bag, but there, you can just feel that there isn't as much seed in there. So you get more for your money for this, I feel. 
Um, one of the things to help you with the germination and keep uh, birds from eating it all, because a lot of people throw it out on the top and they don't cover the seed with uh, soil. Seed mats are great. Uh, I've seen straw used, sawdust, all of those things are good to cover the seed and help keep the air off the grass seeds so that you do have more success in germination. Um, gets a little expensive for the roll matting, but this something like this could be very useful on a hillside where you get water going down and you need to stop the erosion from happening and your seed washing away. So it is good at certain times. Yes? Bio, yes. The question was, is it biodegradable? And yes, it is. The grass grows through it. It's not a netting you put over the top and it grows underneath. Besides, it's unsightly sometimes to see the white netting and you have to leave it there for two, three weeks and the neighbors are wondering, what are you doing? This, at least the grass seed germinates right through it. It biodegrades over a period of time and it's not ugly, it's still green. And you can use sod staples or something like that if you find that it's moving on you a little bit, just to tack down the corners so it stays put. Very good question. Um, one thing about the fertilizing, I want to say after you're done, I like to recommend early in the spring, once you're seeding, is a starter fertilizer. You will find that uh, fertilizers will have uh, a high nitrogen for grass, but it, um, in a starter fertilizer, you'll have a high potass uh, phosphorus. And the phosphorus is needed for newly seeding uh, lawn. Uh, it'll help feed it and the roots will go deeper if you have it. I know we are a high, um, high phosphorus state, so most fertilizers do not have any phosphorus anymore, but it's not always readily available even though it's in there. It's not broke down at a certain level. So I do still recommend when seeding to put a starter fertilizer on also. It will help give the grass a lot better start. Um, when the ironite, you want to look a little better than your neighbors, try putting some ironite on. It'll turn from grass green to a deep blue-green grass. If you're wondering what your neighbors are doing, why theirs is looking a little darker, this is what they're putting down. Um, it's another element in the food that they use, and it'll really give it that deep, dark green grass, and you'll want to, it really looks awesome when it's in. Um, let's see, let's talk about some lawn problems like grubs. Early in the spring, you see this marbling in your lawn, die back after the uh, lawn or the snow comes off. And a lot of problems are because grubs feed all spring. Right now, they're feeding underneath all these. Uh, lawn sprinkled lawns and they're cutting those roots off at about a half an inch. You won't think there's a problem until summer, uh, late summer in July when everything dries out. And then all of a sudden you wonder why is my lawn drying out so fast? Well, the grubs have cut all those roots and they can't replace themselves fast enough so there's not enough there to sustain growth in the heat of the summer and then obviously coming back out of uh, summer into the spring. So you have a grub problem uh, and those are those Japanese beetles and other things, big beetles that are flying around. June beetles are a grub. Those are the ones that are, have been eat, feeding all season long. So I do recommend um, a blanket control of um, a grub killer. This also does ants and other things that you might have in your landscape bed. So perennial beds also. If you have moles, I promise you have grubs. Uh, this is one way, if you, kill, if you want to get rid of uh, moles in your lawn, put this stuff down. If they don't have any food to eat, they got to go somewhere else. It's probably going to be the neighbors. <laughs> so it's a good way of controlling it. So kill their food source. Yes? Name of that stuff again? Uh, th there's many brands out there. This is Bears, Bear Complete. And I do like it because it does a wide range. It's not just grubs. And this does uh, three months control. You have it both in a granular, which ends up being cheaper per square foot, because this does 10,000 square foot. They do have, uh, we didn't bring it, but it's a bottle that looks like this, in the and it says bear complete also. But I know that bottle that looks like this is, uh, only does 5,000 square foot, and it's about the same amount of dollars. So it is a better buy to do granulars. And all you have to do is Mother Nature waters it in, it's done, it's three month control. So it's, and it's with kill within 24 hours of being watered into your lawn. So it's very, very good. Um, 
Some people right now, because we're getting into the broadleaf weeds, um, you may have Creeping Charlie that you can't get rid of. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question about the grub? Yes. Is it pet safe? Uh, well, once it's watered in, it's pet safe on the granular because it soaks into the soil. Just keep the pets off. If you're using the liquid version that I told you, the blue bottle, uh, make sure it's dry before you have the pets walk on it, okay? But the granular kind of gets at the thatch layer and then is watered in and, it, and then it's fine after it's dry, okay? Um, we control, and this is called a post-emergent. Post-emergent, again, is killing the plants that are already there, green and growing. These products are sprayed onto the plants, absorbed through the plant, and kills then after that, either by salts or using 2,4-D or whatever active ingredient are in there. There's other chemicals and stuff. I won't get into that as much. But uh, two primary chemicals that you need to use is, one, this does broadleaf weeds, uh, dandelions, um, it will hurt Creeping Charlie, it will hurt some of the clovers, and it will hurt some of the violets that are in your yard, but it won't necessarily kill them unless you hit it twice. So then I recommend the Creeping Charlie spray, which is this unit. Um, this will do about 3,400 square foot. One application should knock out all Creeping Charlie. If you do this first, it does about 80% of the weeds. Whatever's left, this will take care of. It's, they both are called Weed Be Gone. This says Clover and Creeping Charlie. This says it'll do it, but you don't always get 100%. So just kind of letting you know. Yes, question. Why don't you just go with the one that'll kill everything? Because it, it hurts it, but it may not kill it. Then that's this one. Why bother using this? Because broadleaf weeds are different than clovers and uh, Creeping Charlie. It's in a different weed category. And that's why this one doesn't kill everything. This one will kill all, about 80% of it, okay? So if you, yes, question. Does the Creeping Charlie one come in a uh, spray to in a hole? No, unfortunately it does not. But they've got great products out here. And Ortho has one. Uh, we have one that's called the Chameleon. They work the same. You have a nozzle here that goes into the bottle. These bottles can screw directly on. So you just hook it up to your garden hose. It says maybe, I know this one says one fluid ounce to a gallon. You dial it for one fluid ounce to a gallon, hook it up to your garden hose, and you go to the back of the yard and you back walk and spray. All right, that way you're not walking over what you're doing. So you definitely want to keep that in mind. Yes? How expensive is that price for the uh, charges? Uh, $8. Right around eight dollars. Not too bad for 3,400 square foot. This sprayer that I, I'm talking about is right around ten, ten, eleven dollars. But assuming you know what you use, what chemical you put in there, I like to have you wash it out all the time so that you're not cross-contaminating different chemicals and things. You wouldn't want to put Roundup in here, which kills everything, including lawn, and then mix it and think you're. <laughs> safe. You don't want to do that. So make sure you clean it out or at least write on the bottle what you put in there so that you don't forget or have one that's labeled on top. So, um, let's see, what should we, one of the other, here's a triazicide. This is a cheap uh, way of killing some grubs too. Um, it's a liquid version. I told you about the bear. Here's a triazicide. A little bit uh, less expensive, but Sometimes it doesn't do as good a control. I've used it both, I've used the Bare Complete and I've used the Triazicide, and I have to say that I like the, tri, uh, the Bare Complete better. It covers a wider range of, pro, uh, of insects, so. Um, I'll go into dog spots. Lime in the early spring, I like, if you think it's an, uh, you have dog, you have little spots all over. Sometimes it's an acidic problem that might be there, so to make sure you have success in growing uh, in those spots, a little lime put on that area will make it from acidic to more alkaline, and the seed will have a better chance of growing. Uh, there are easy seeds out there that have the seed and dog spot stuff in it, but gypsum is what they put in their seed. And you can buy a large bag of gypsum for five, six dollars, 50 pound bag. And gypsum is a, uh, in your lawn, is a chemical way of loosening it without tilling it. 
So it helps the water filtrate down through. Now in Bloomington, we have a lot of sand and not a lot of clay. There are some pockets, but it's, gypsum is better for clay areas, not necessarily sand. So gypsum probably won't percolate your lawn or your ground as well in sand as it would in clay. So kind of know your area before you ask for it. It's not gonna hurt to put gypsum down, but it's not gonna help either. So that's why I say maybe a little uh, lime on those dog spots and you can control it a lot more. All right, any questions on lawns? Yes. After uh, putting new seed down, how long after, after germinating can you put that uh, Creeping Charlie applied? Ah, very good question. Uh, with Creeping Charlie spray um, and, or, and or any broadleaf spray that you put down, New seed is, even though it doesn't hurt, the sprays are not supposed to hurt grass, uh, it requires about, I like to say, two mowings, all right? So when the seed germinates and gets, uh, gets a little seed pot on it, you mow it once, wait another week and mow it again, and then it should be adult enough that it can handle the sprays. Because even though it's a grass, it's a young blade of grass, and it can't tolerate those chemicals, and it'll burn. So that's why you have to stay off of it for efficient, a sufficient amount of time in order to have success. All right? Yes? What if you have a lot of shaded areas? Okay, the question was, what, do we, what if we have a lot of shaded areas? Um, shaded and you can't get grass to grow? Is that right? Um, there are different sh shade mixes that you can buy. There is a certain, like trees or behind a house or something like that, that you have to buy the shade, dense shade mix. It's still gonna have a blend, but it's gonna be higher on the red fescue, so you'll have more success. It'll have red fescue and then perennial rye in it, and those numbers will be a slightly higher and less Kentucky bluegrass. You don't wanna do just all red fescue because you're gonna visually see that difference in your lawn and you don't want that to be aligned. So you want some blends so it goes in and out of shade very easily without being seen. But even under some oak trees and behind houses and things like that, there's gonna be a point where you can't grow grass anymore unless you get more light, more water, and food. And you have to work it out. So if you can trim up your trees and get more light in there, That'll help. Uh, watering is essential because those trees are sucking up all the water, all the nutrients and everything, and you can't, it just can't live if it, do, if it doesn't have those things. So you try to make it the best environment you can, and there's eventually a point where you're just gonna have to live with it. Um, I maybe recommend, uh, if you can't grow grass in those areas, is maybe mulch it and turn it into a landscape bed and adding perennials or something like that, or a nice ground cover that's low maintenance and easy to take care of and still pleasant to the eye. Okay? What happens if you use this dead shade one in the sunny area? Uh, it won't grow as well. It'll, it'll germinate fine, but then the heat is going to kill it. So you really need to do more of a blend or mix a little of this with some of the sun and shade mix because when you go with these mixes here, this has got shade mix in it too. So it's gonna blend in and out very easily. You just, where it's really dense, you wanna go with this and then cross them a little bit. Mix them both together, yeah. And then what it, let it all germinate and then you'll find that one will take over and it's gonna be probably the red fescue, okay? I don't want to mow my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> grass can grow. That'll only grow like three inches tall. <laughs> Artificial turf. No, <laughs> no um, <laughs> they do have some grasses that they say are uh, low maintenance where you don't have to mow a lot. I don't know how, how hardy those are. I'm still. Yeah. Yeah, it, in Minnesota, we're vi yes, you can buy these uh, dense shade mi or these sh these grass seeds, uh, but they're not super hardy, and you can have problems with disease and things like that throughout the summer. Um, I guess I might have to say don't fertilize as much. <laughs> and oh, I, as long as we're talking about grass, I I will say most people who um, do have weed problems in their lawn. I can almost guarantee you're mowing your lawn improperly. That means that you're scalping your lawn. And I will tell you a little bit about that I learned from the Scotts Company and how they test their chemicals. 
they mow their lawn incorrectly and it looks like a dandelion field. I'm telling you, it looks like they seeded it and everything. And they said, no, all they do is they scalp their lawn real low and the, they naturally come through. So I recommend three inches or more uh, of height when you're mowing. And uh, if it's dry that week, don't mow it. Let it be a little shaggy. It's only going to keep that grass healthy and more pliable through the, the, the stress of the season. Once you know there's uh, going to be a storm coming, mow it down that next day or that day before, and then let it rain and you'll find it'll start to grow. Now, the, the reason why it's going to shade the, the grass and it's going to help the crown of the plant, also dandelions and those things don't grow well in shade. They need full sun. They need those bare patches and crabgrass included, which you'll start to see. I've seen some in some lawns right now. Um, just starting to pop up for signs of it and it's always in a bare area where it's getting full sun and it got warm early in the spring. So crabgrass is short, right? Uh, crabgrass is, well, it's short when it comes up and it's a very light green and then when it grows, it grows up and flat and it just takes up all the area. So if you can shade it, you'll control it better and it gets... Just let it grow because it's flat. Well, you can let it grow, yes. <laughs> It, yeah, it's better than dirt, I will say. Um, and crabgrass is controlled by, whoops, by the broadleaf weed killers, okay? The crabgrass, does it have things like grass shoots or does it have a, a leaf? It, it's, it's a wide blade grass and it grows up from the center and pull a, and out and it flat. It's a growing in a clump and when you pull it, the, there's little hair roots that grow in a clump. Quack grass is the first thing we see in the season, and that gets tall and long, and when you pull it, you get these like veins that come out, and it seems like if you don't get the whole root, it will just keep coming up, and it's very hard to control. So the only way to control it is unfortunately Roundup. Um, it, but this kills everything, because quack grass is the same as grass in the same family, and that's why you can't just kill it like that. You could maybe take concentrate with a, put gloves on, take concentrated Roundup, maybe put a little food coloring in it, and then dip it and just touch those leaves. All, if you get a little concentrate on one plant, that plant's dead. And it goes back into the, the plant and kills the root back a little ways. Okay, you had a question back there? Yeah, as far as keeping your grass kind of shorter, or keeping it longer to shade out the weeds, I have, um, sometimes they're called fairy rings or like areas of my lawn that's super fertile and grows really fast. So if I let the rest of the yard get a little shaggy, like it's, it'll bog down my lawn. Uh -huh. Is there any way to help manage that? There's not. Um, you just got to mow it or pull it or whatever. If, is it in your perennial beds? No, it's just my lawn. Oh, it's your lawn. You've got a lot of moisture in there because a, a well-fed lawn and a uh, well watered lawn is going to grow more um, so there's you maybe cut back on the fertilizing a little bit a patch in the front yard there might there might be more water there or some kind of maybe tile that's broke or something some reason why there's more it's more green and a little bit taller there there's some food there water something's there to keep it longer uh, might be just natural so um, that is about all you can do unfortunately. Okay. Uh, when feeding your lawn, I will say that uh, a new application can be put down every six to eight weeks. So if you have a sprinkler, you can do sooner. If you don't and it's mother nature, maybe you wait eight weeks. It depends on how much it's been raining on how soon you put it down. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let's go into maybe the trees and shrubs and some pros and cons. Um, as you can see with this table, I've got a variety of evergreens and uh, tall shrubs, short shrubs, things like that. One of the things I noticed a lot that you probably have is burn on your yews and your arborvitae. Now, I, one of you had, was it you that had? Somebody had a problem, it was you. All right. Uh, she had a mention that there's a lot of dieback. It's green underneath, but the top is brown, and you just don't know what to do. And I'm getting a lot of that at Home Depot. Also, arborvitaes that are marbled, where maybe one whole side is brown, and then you've got some green patches here and there. That plant is not dead. Yes? 
I'm going to ask, what's an arborvitae? Oh, this is an arborvitae. Okay. All right. It's a, it's a type of uh, evergreen. Okay. All right. They can be globe or they can be tall pyramidal that you see at the cemetery. You know, there's lots of different kinds of, uh, of uh, arborvitae, and that's what this is. This is a small arborvitae. I brought it just because I can pick it up and move it, but they can get quite wide. Um, what I recommend in, uh, if you have a plant like this is take the brown and brush it out. We want to open up, get light inside there, because you will get some new growth that will come out. And because you have a, um, an adult root system down there, it should, and you, if you feed it properly, you should get that new growth to be induced a lot more and you'll find that it'll fill in those gaps really quickly. Um, I'm seeing a lot of even ewes that are, there's new growth in there. So just because it's brown on the outside does not mean that that stem is dead. So, Leave it as much as you can. If you break it and it's dry and brittle, obviously that's dead, cut it out. But if you think that there's something pliable there, leave it because you will get this new growth that will come out. And because it's all exposed to the sun, it's gonna fill in that plant so you can save it. So that's why I don't always recommend removing it just because it's brown. Gotta give it a little time. Feeding it with a liquid feed, always is going to help induce that a little bit more or a liquid feed is going to give it instant one um, food for um, growing right away it's like an IV for plants but there's no longevity so I do recommend maybe a granular put around the base of it and then water that in also uh, so that you give it something instant and then the the granular right around the plant will soak into the ground and help feed that plant later on how fast does that grow? How big will it be body? Are you talking the U or the arborvitae? Oh, arborvitae. Uh, no, the, the. Spreading U's actually only grow four to six inches probably a season. They can maybe grow longer. A lot of people plant these and think, oh, I don't have to do anything and just let them go. And then they get ginormous. So what I do recommend is pruning them lightly. And I like to call it feathering as a technique. I take a pruner something like this, and I go in and I take the longest branch and I'll go back into the plant and cut it. That, and that, may, that opens up gaps. It's taken it back a little bit and I do it sporadically throughout all the way around the plant. So if there's like 20 branches on that plant, I will take maybe five or six out and take it back into the mid portion of the plant. And then I keep doing that until I got a nice shaped plant. And maybe the next round, I'll go only a couple inches back so it's feathered nicely. Yes? If you leave that that you just cut, would it grow? No, it will not. Uh, you require rooting hormones in order for that. The question was if she would uh, be able to replant the cut that she cut off. And it requires rooting hormone for that, so it probably would not work in a shrub environment or, to, or uh, for a shrub. There are some other plants like perennials and annuals that you can do that, but not with shrubs, not easily anyways, okay? I have done it on some hydrangeas. They seem to root pretty good. Um, I, this is a hydrangea and it requ doesn't require a lot of light. It does best in full sun, but it can tolerate the shade. Um, and these are the same plant as this. This is an annual and what? There are different types of hydrangeas that can take only shade and sun and some inside. And because I, when I went looking for planting where densely shaded area was, I was told for hydrangeas. But then when I looked, there were so many different varieties that I could. There are, in Minnesota, there are different varieties. And in, in the floral area, indoor, you'll see a lot of these deep blues and deep pinks. Um, Minnesota, when you drive around, you don't see a lot of deep blues and deep pinks. So a flag should go up right away saying, ah, what's going on here? Yes, you can buy them, but they are not winter hardy. They're for warmer climates. So Iowa and below <laughs> is what it's for. But you can grow them outside on your patio, enjoy the flowers, let them go dormant and put them in the basement where it's not going to freeze or maybe in an insulated garage and then put them back outside. 
but a lot of people don't want to do that. Uh, they just want to enjoy it and that be it. But there are varieties that are hardy, and this is a, they're coming out with new ones, and I, I brought this one because it is a newer variety. This has kind of got a light pink with some white swirl in it. So it's kind of new. It's not going to be quite as big of a flower, but they are pretty durable, uh, in, especially in the Minneapolis area. You start outside, yeah, they are winter hardy, meaning that uh, they can take our real harsh winters. Uh, believe it or not, Minneapolis, Bloomington, we have a well-developed area here, and I have gotten some zone five plants to overwinter, but you kinda gotta know your, your lot and where it's more protected, but you can get some of these warmer climate plants to live in it, but you do have to baby them a bit. That means covered, protected by a fence, protected by a house, a garage, something, and then maybe insulate even better around the side of the plant. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. You see, keep saying that you gotta kind of know your zone. How do you know what zone you're in? What we are zone four. We are solid zone four. And so plants say on there what zone that they are on the back of the tag. It'll say whether it's a zone four or zone five. The higher the number, the warmer the climate. So, so those, and you also said that all the soil is different and you should uh, Most of them are sandy. Soil texture doesn't matter as much. You get better growth in sandy soil than you do in clay soil because it's harder for roots to, to push through that clay soil. So you will get better growth, but it doesn't affect hardiness as much. Uh, as wind, when I talk about, it's the wind burn that can happen on some of these evergreens and some of these shrubs that really um, hurt them. And because we have so much tar, so much pavement, and well-developed area here, we, we are a warmer climate because the buildings do help us out a little bit. Just like Chicago, it's 20 degrees warmer and cooler there just because of the body of water that they have. So in the I, summer, I it's 20 degrees. These up against a fence, and they did very well. Yeah, and they like a little heavier soil, our true sandy soils, they don't like as much on hydrangeas. But one thing I wanted to say is, um, there are varieties that are starting to get colored, but if they're the blue, this is an annual. Um, so you gotta watch. Uh, sometimes you can, there's Endless Summer is a good hydrangea that can be changed from blue to pink. And by just doing the lime, lime, if you notice the picture on there is pink, you'll get more pink. If you want to make your endless summer blue, buy your sulfur, and sulfur changes the pH and makes it more acid, and you get more blue. So by changing that soil pH that we normally have, is which is seven, you raising it higher or lower, you can kind of manipulate the color just a little bit. All right? Yes, question? Huh? What did you say? Lime. Lime. Lime for the pink, sulfur for the blue, okay? And on these bags, it makes it real easy because there's the picture. <laughs> so you don't have to remember it. Just know I need one or the other because sulfur, sulfur and lime are the only two that change soil pH. I don't care who says what. That's the only thing you're going to change it with, okay? And the scale goes from 0 to 14, and we are a 7, just so you know. So we're right in the middle. So you just pitch it a little bit differently on either side, and you can get the color change. Uh, there are other varieties if you want a deeper color, obviously, you can manipulate that color just a bit more, all right, depending on what you're choosing. Does that affect the other plants which are near it? It can. So you just do around the base, or what I like to call the drip line of the plant. If I t wherever the rain hits, it goes straight down, just do it around the drip line of the plant and you should be safe and not altering the other areas. Okay? Dig it back up in the fall, put it in the basement, what do you do, let it stay dry all the You water it lightly, let the leaves fall off and go dormant like normal, or keep it in a container above ground and move it around on your patio. It's fine, uh, because not everybody's going to want to dig it up, so it's easier to at least have it in a container so you can move it around easier. Makes Those it a lot easier. In yeah, I, I do recommend them, but if the color is true, too blue, too pink, I want you to ask more questions because it may not be hardy, okay? And it usually has a floral wrapping on it and all that too, so uh, that's a good sign that it's more for, they're calling it an indoor or a gift or something like that for other people, okay? Um, 
Uh, one thing I like to get, uh, go through if you're trying to enhance your landscape, if you notice that I got a lot of evergreens and foliage plants, different things, notice how I haven't really got a lot of flowers in here, but I've got a lot of interest. I've got variegated with yellow, with green and evergreen, and then I got burgundy foliage. So there's a lot of interesting things happening without any flowers. And a lot of the foliage, these are ready to flower with a, a lavender purple type of a flower. You can shave them off after they're done and they'll reflower again. But in a landscape, think about the colors and the textures and how they look good together when you're putting something together first. And the flowers, don't think about it, just call it a bonus, all right? Because it's just going to look better when they're flowering. Um, all right, let's go with, uh, what are we, how are we doing for time? 20 minutes. How, any other questions on maybe shrubs? Yes. I have lilac bushes around my whole perimeter. Uh-huh. How do I keep them flowering and they're out of control? Okay. Lilacs are unique because they grow in second year growth. So once the flowers are done blooming, that's your opportunity to trim it however you want. It, well, the lilacs haven't quite finished yet, I don't think. Wait until the flower dies down and looks kind of ratty. Then go back and trim it. Now, if it's a standard bush that's 10, 12 foot high, those have limits on how far you can trim them back or you may sacrifice the flowers even next year. All right? You can maybe take a couple feet off or you can take large branches that are way out of control. Thin them all the way back to the main part of the plant, which will induce new growth again. But uh, lilacs are, you can only get them to bloom so long, unfortunately, and it has to grow on second year growth, so you must trim it right after it's done, so it has time to send out new growth, so you'll get flowers the next season. It will make it thicker and fuller by trimming it lightly. Uh, you know, I'd say a couple foot is not a problem, okay. all right? And there's standard, or there are plants like Miss Kim, Korean, that only get four or five foot, I like to trim maybe a third of those back just to give them a nice shape and they'll be thick and dense by the next season. Do you think I can do to fertilize them to help the flowers look prettier or is it just trimming them and... Trimming them, keeping them thick will give you more flowers. Fertilizing will give you more growth, which will also give you more flowers, but it won't intensify the color or anything like that. Uh, I recommend sh uh, fertilizing always all your trees and shrubs once a season especially in sand because there's really not a lot of nutrients there other than what mother nature gives you through the rain and stuff so it's always good because the nitrogen always gets flushed through the sand it moves where phosphorus stays put and stuff like that so okay any other questions yeah, I can have one that question. Uh, this lilac seems to lose color as the years pass uh, I like those more Vibrant. Vibrant. It could be, fertilizer can help intensify the color, but it may not a lot. So, I mean, making it a little darker, it might help. But would it, you put sulfur, would it work? Huh? Would you, if you put sulfur, would it work? No, no. That, that is one plant that isn't affected by sulfur or lime. So you, but you do need regular nutrients to feed it, okay? Yes. Separate from grass fertilizers? So oh yes, grass fertilizer, for example, like these, have a 30, 30, what is it, 30 zero, what is it? It is a 28, three and seven. So very high in the nitrogen, that's what makes it grow. So if you wanna, whenever you're buying fertilizer, I'll go into this. You have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, all three numbers on every kind of fertilizer. If you remember this phrase, you'll always kind of know what it does to the plant. Top growth, root growth, and disease resistances. That's what it does for that plant. So like lawns, you want a lot of nitrogen, so that's top growth, so that's the first number. If you want a good root system or lots of flowers for your annuals and perennials, you want a higher middle number, which is the phosphorus, because that also helps with roots and flowering and slash fruiting. So you want a little higher middle number. And the, the potassium is used more in the fall, and that helps all the new nitrates work together a little bit more. Helps everything work symbiotically, okay? 
So that's kind of what it does with the plant. All right. All right. Uh, with some of the annuals, uh, I'd like to show you perennials. I've been mixing these in with my uh, landscape designs a lot more lately. And I wanted to kind of show, you could see the colors and textures with these also. Uh, these three, I'm going to move this table over here. These three are in the same family. And there are so many different varieties, but you can see they've got great color interest in it, uh, just by looking at them. Lots of color there. And you really don't have any flowers. The white is not really interesting to me. It's okay. It's a bonus, I guess, but I'd rather see the foliage. And they, there's some that are very, very lime yellow green, and you start mixing those in it. So it really enhances your perennial area. And what I brought a lot of these for, here for is to show how texture can help with, oh, yep. see how you got so much more interest, and I really don't have a lot of flowers, but I have texture and color change with just the, the large leaves and the, the real dainty and fine with the bigger um, multicolored uh, leaves. Grasses help give a new texture to it too. Everything enhances the whole bed. So when you're designing something or putting perennials together, don't stick a lot of grasses together because although there's color change there, it doesn't look as good as it does if you break it up, okay? So think of texture when you're designing. And like I said, flowers are a bonus. So these are two different daylilies. Both have a grassy foliage texture. This one grows about knee high, two, knee high for the foliage, and then the flower shoots up into the three foot range, two and a half to three foot. Where this is Stella Dior, this stays at about knee high, and the flower might uh, shoot up just slightly above the foliage. It's very tight and compact, and if you notice, a lot of the cities are using these now in their public areas because this plant blooms all summer long. So once it starts flowering, it sends up sporadic flowers throughout the season. Obviously, fertilizer can help with that too, okay, by having a little higher phosphorus in it. What is the one in your organ? This is called Stella Diora, and you can buy Stella Diora. They have a couple colors. Stella Diora is the most common, um, and it's the yellow butter yellow kind of flower. There is a burgundy or slash red one. But I find that those, although the foliage looks very similar, I don't find that the other colors bloom as much as what the Stella does. The Stella is a very good bloomer and a great addition to a, a landscape mixed in with some shrubs. As you can see, you put it next to some evergreen, you got some great color textures. These things should be towards the front of the garden or by the door to enhance it a little bit more. Um, I like even mixing the corbels because all three of these are corbels. You get the corbels in there and you've got some nice color change. So uh, little pockets here and there. I used to never mix and now I started mixing and I like the landscape a lot better. So um, by putting them in with other plants, you'll find that it enhancifies everything. Um, let's go into the annuals. I think one of my favorites now is kind of this. This is a mandevilla. Comes in a few different colors, the pinks, the whites, the reds. It's a great vine. Um, it's expensive up front, because I think this one is $21. But this thing, uh, if you get the right plant, the small leaves don't grow as much. You get three to four foot high. You can put it next to a trellis, and it'll just climb right over it. And it'll take it over. So great for the patio with a little, to get a little more height and it'll flower like this all summer long. It loves the heat. And keep it watered, keep it fertilized, and you're gonna get nonstop blooming all season long. And like I said, the small leaves are gonna be a shorter plant, so don't be fooled. The larger leaves are a couple that have a little larger leaf, about like that, and those grow very aggressively. And the flowers tend to be a little bit larger too. Um, so if you have a six foot area or eight foot area that you wanna cover, Make sure you get the larger leaf mandevillas. This is just a very contained flowering, and you get this kind of flowering all the time. So it's great for the patio. 
Uh, and we have, you can get them in a hanging basket. You can get them in a one gallon container. And one gallon containers are this size. And you can also get them in a, like a three gallon container that's tall already at about three, four foot. So they come in various sizes already ready to go. It's just what size do you want to start out with and how much do you want to spend to get that pop of color. But it's great. It's very, very excellent. Mandevilla, yep. No, unfortunately, it is a tropical, so as soon as the temperature hits about 40, <laughs> that plant is not as happy with you. It, it, it's just not. Now, I, this is the first year that um, I've tried overwintering it. I know you can. Um, and mine held the foliage and flowered throughout most of the winter, but I had it in an, a southeast window, so it got lots of light and then you can keep it flowering. But do cut it back because it's just not gonna like it, the lower light. Flowering through the year? I was able to keep it flowering throughout the winter months until I could get it out of my patio when it was above 40. So, and now I put it in a hanging basket and I, I'm adding curly Q willows to it and uh, gives a little more pow to the, the patio. Okay, and it has something to grow on too. So, uh, works really well. It's one of my favorites. If I got that for my mom who lives in Cloquet, would it last there? Absolutely. As long as it's above 40. Well, it loves the heat is what I'm saying. What you like living in, it likes living in. And it can take it hotter. Seems like the hotter it is, the faster it grows. I don't know. It's just a, it's an aggressive plant. But excellent for the patio. All right. Um, Something I'd like to go into is, uh, this is quarter line, which is red star. Uh, it's something you've seen the green spikes and stuff. I thought I'd bring a sample of this. This happens to be a $25 plant, I think, but $22. You can get them in smaller individual containers. Um, I haven't seen a lot in the nurseries, but they are out there. Um, they're excellent for in a container like this. If you want a little pizzazz to a container, you can tuck this in instead of the, the canna, and you have a whole different look, okay? I, I'm just showing it to you because it's, it gets your, uh, keeps the ideas growing in your head, and uh, you, maybe you're sick of the, the green spike. Here's a good substitute for that. Um, a little tip, I've had one for five years. I had mine six foot high, and the, the stem of the unit was this big. I couldn't put it in my house I, this winter. I'm like, I looked at it, it was hitting the ceiling, and I'm like, oh, this looks bad. So I cut it off. And I'm like, no, I don't like that either. So then I got mad and I just cut it off at three foot. <laughs> well, <laughs> what happened was I left it in the container with all the flowers and kind of kept them green. But what happened is that stem started sprouting all these spikes out of it. And now I got a great looking plant that's a little shorter. I can start it all over again. So it's kind of great. Uh, you know, I know a little bit about plants, but I still learn too, and I practice at home so I can teach you guys. <laughs> so. And then another very, very popular plant. Uh, it's, it's big. Um, they are expensive, but you can overwinter them. You can even overwinter your green spikes, so. So these last two are annuals. These are all annuals now, yeah. If it freezes, this can t probably take about 40, well, you can, I've gotten it down to about 34, 36. It doesn't like you either. <laughs> but it can take some of those colder nights. Uh, but 32, no, don't do any of it. Uh, but I try overwintering things from time to time because it gets expensive. So when you can take a 20, I, I have a couple that I started from just a little spike, and now they're this high. That's a $21 plant, and when they get bigger, you can't even find them that big. So uh, just kind of letting you know that overwintering them in the house can give your house some color, interest, keep the humidity up when it's dry in the wintertime. Helps out a lot. You don't have to have a humidifier when you have a lot of plants in. What's the annual then? Annual dies every season. If it, hits, if it freezes, it's dead. A perennial freezes down. These are perennials here. And the roots, the top of the plant will die, but the root is still alive. So um, it will come back again in the spring. And shrubs, they always come back from their original stems, whether it's an evergreen or a deciduous woody plant, OK? So it, it leaves out from the actual stem, and it doesn't die back, typically. 
Some plants do. Okay. All right. Um, so as long as you keep them inside, they will still. Yes, because it's living in the environment it likes. 70 degree temperature, so you're well above 40 degrees, which annuals typically, not every annual can be brought in the house because of it needs more light. Inside, even in a south window, is not as bright as it would be outside in the shade. I should let you know. So plants will always do better with uh, more uh, indirect light outside. So. Although that with that spike that I showed you there, be careful. We like full sun too, but we can't go out in it the first time that it uh, gets warm. We can burn. Plants like that will burn too. So you kind of, I put them out underneath a tree on the north side of the house where it's shaded, give it a little more protection for a couple weeks, and then I can push it wherever I want once it's adapted to the light. So be careful when you're pushing things from inside, outside. They will burn. Palms, I've done that with palms too, okay? Um, some about, I wanted to talk a little bit about some container growing. If you can t see here, we got large textured uh, leaves with lime green potato vine. Potato vine will just spill out over the floor. Uh, the more room you give it, the, it seems like boom, the more it grows. So if, if it's really planted in a tight container like this, you can kind of control how much it grows because it's competing with all the other plants. But if you put it in a big planter all by itself, I'm telling you that thing can be five, six foot wide and it will just eat it up and it loves the moisture. So don't be afraid of it. It looks excellent in large planters. Um, you got lobelia here, little blue. See how it's dainty and fine and airy. Um, and then mixed with some petunias. Kind of wanted to show you how you can get a lot of color there with that, all right? And cannas, um, like dahlias, if you guys know what dahlias are, the bulbs can be dug up, cut the top off, and overwinter it in a cellar or a basement somewhere. Or how about your refrigerator in the vegetable drawer uh, where there's not, it's not so dry. You can overwinter those roots there and they like that cool environment. And then you can plant them again in the spring in your container and save it if you like to. So I've done a little bit of that sometimes. Yeah, if you're ever familiar with amaryllis at winter, that big flower, um, you can, after it's flowered, you can take that and put that in the frigidaire and then in the spring you can get it grow again. I, I do it every year. It loves being grown outside. I, I know I have some and I, I plant them out in the yard because it gets like an onion bulb on, her, on it and the bulb will grow and get bigger because it's got lots of light to develop that bulb. Then when fall comes you dig it up cut off the top, dry it out a little bit for a couple weeks, and then plant it inside. And it will start sending up new foliage and uh, reflower again. OK. Um, and this is just an indoor tropical. I brought in a sample. Uh, this is excellent for a formal patio. Can be grown in the house in lower light, but it also can be grown in full sun on your patio. Think about this, just because you buy it inside and it said indoor tropical does not mean you can't put it outside in the patio to add extra texture and color and enjoy it around your patio table. So it can be shaped very easily with the clippers and stuff like that. Okay, any questions? All right, looks like our time is about up. I, I'd like to thank you guys all for coming. I hope I answered a lot of your questions. And I, if you have questions to ask me on the side, I'm certainly here to answer all of those too for you, all right? What's your name again? Bradley yes. Phillips, yes. If you I blew, at the Bloomington store, yes. <laughs> if you ask for Brad in garden, everyone knows. There are people, I see, <laughs> There are people that come in and they know me by name and they seek me out. So yes. <laughs> and if you my name's been getting out there. And because I've been there 17 years, I got a lot of people that call me specifically and ask me for questions. And I can handle all of them. It's just that sometimes I'm hard to find because I'm with somebody. <laughs> and if you ask for Pat, they'll know who I am. <laughs> yes. Can I have a question also for bugs or pests? Yes. What do you recommend? Are we talking lawn or are we talking house? Well, we are getting ants in the house. You're getting ants in the house? Yeah. 
we do have so a product called Home Defense. Now, although I recommend starting in your yard and use a complete Home Defense, Which one? this one, the silver bag, you can either use this one okay. or, which is a silver bag, there's other products too that will do the same thing, or you can use the Try as a Side, does ants, because they're soil, kind of, they live in the soil. So this doing a perimeter around your house can control it, but in the house, now this lasts for 12, up to 12 months based on UV exposure. So you can spray areas that are not going to be touched by your hands or feet or something like that because you got to be worried about kids and pets. But you can spray a perimeter around windows, around the door frames, in the rafters. This controls ants, spiders, all those kinds of bugs. It's actually strong enough to control scorpions and uh, brown spiders and black widow spiders. So this is made for the whole nation and it lasts. So uh, you can use for cockroaches and things like that. I know you get into it. This does control all of those. So you put it behind appliances where you know you're never touching. All right, pull out the appliance, spray around it. Go in the basement, spray in the rafters. Spray around the outside of the windows where you're never going to touch. You will be able to control all those insects with this. It's a barrier that you're kind of putting there that if they cross it, they're going to die. They don't just cross it and die right away, but they do over time, okay? So home defense is sold in a little spray bottle. You can also get it by the gallon, a pump spray, and then spray around. But it's excellent. And this is called home defense. And you can do that inside or outside. Inside or outside, yes, you can. If you're doing it outside, I recommend getting the larger bottle, spraying about the top eight, uh, the bottom 18 inches all the way around the house, no one's going to touch there. All right? And it's, it's really very affordable, the, the larger one. And yeah. And then it's got a, a nozzle that you, you know, I use this all the time and it works excellent. Now, in this particular product, pro, this one is ready to use, so are the other ones that are sold. I do recommend buying Always Concentrate because you get more bang for your buck. Unless you like convenience, then you can buy ready to use. But it doesn't always go as far, and it's going to cost you a little more. So keep that in mind on some of the products, OK? Yes, question. Does that take care of box elder bugs, too? Absolutely. Yep. Isn't the large concentrate? No, these are all ready to use. And fortunately, in the home defense, all of it comes ready to use in the household products. I don't have a concentrate. But when it comes to lawns, I do have concentrates and I have ready to use. And it's always a better buy to go with concentrate. This is concentrate. Remember I told you about the broadleaf weed killer? This is concentrate and does 5,000 square foot. Just this little bottle. Um, where we do sell the ready to use, which is a gallon, and it only maybe covers 300 square foot. So it, the home defense is only ready to use. It's only ready to use, yes. OK? But it, it's an excellent product. What could I use to uh, keep the deer away from the arbor bite? Ah. Yes, that can be an issue. Um, we have products out there, like this is called Liquid Fence, and it can be sprayed on those evergreens in the wintertime to help keep them from feeding. Unfortunately, deer are eating your arborvitaes because that's the only food they got. They prefer grass and stuff like that, but they want those needles. Um, another thing you can use, and I don't know if everybody knows this, but um, you don't, the liquid fence is easy to buy off the shelf and you can get it, but there's egg whites in here. Um, if you do, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, if you put three eggs whites in a gallon of water, spray it on your plants, that's hostas and things like that, that are maybe by a woods that the, the, the deer are eating a lot of. The egg whites, they can't stand it, and they will not go towards it. Now, the egg whites will eventually wash off, but it is a very good deterrent for deer. It doesn't work on rabbits and uh, squirrels and those other things, but for deer, it's very good, effective. So. I've been using coyote urine for my raccoon problem, but it's not working. Uh, that's because the raccoons are eating your grubs in your lawn. You need to do grub control which I, you know, that home, the lawn, um, where's that silver bag again? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> so, some like this. Raccoons love those grubs. They're plump and juicy, full of protein. 
I'm sorry, they're making little holes in the lawn all over and they're doing more damage to your lawn. So uh, using that, raccoons are very hard to control, but they are probably eating those kind of things out of your lawn, okay? Um, coyote, you earn, the more deterrents you use on top of one another, the better the luck you're gonna have too. But deterrents are deterrents, you know, at best, okay? Yes? When you come to the store with a picture of the house and the little stances of the yard, it's like you give it advice and most of the goods. That's the best way to do it for me. Not everybody can do it, but I can design on the spot. So I've seen enough houses that I can to do it right away. Yeah. Okay, it's time to, I'm sorry, Brad. That's all right. Time to wrap it up. Brad, we'll stick around a little bit yes. to answer some questions. We have to, did anyone not put in a uh, registration for a prize? Again, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you.